Ah ha ha. Welcome to the 16th episode of The Bottom Line. This is my seventh edition of the MMA Bottom Line. I am your host, none other than, if you'd already know, then you don't know. But if you don't know, now you know. Davidson Baker, welcome to the 16th episode. And I'm not going to waste any time because I do have a lot to get to in a little short period of time. I got about an hour and 20 minutes until my favorite thing in the world, the Contender Series, kicks off tonight, week four. Great card of five fights. So let's begin. Uh, recapping this past week in the International Fight Week spectrum, it was a serious, serious display, uh, especially the UFC 226 main card delivered. Um, let's dive right into it. So Daniel Cormier takes out the longest reigning heavyweight champion, Stipe Miocic. By way of knockout, four minutes and 33 seconds into the opening frame to dethrone the longest tenured UFC heavyweight champion and now becomes the fifth man to hold belts in two different divisions and the second man to do that at the same exact time. The first, of course, being Conor McGregor. The difference between DC's uh, possible legacy and what Conor McGregor's was as the champ champ, so to speak, is that DC plans on defending both one more time each. Um, I don't know how you cannot throw Daniel Cormier's name into the conversation of the greatest of all time at this point. In my opinion, you have two different conversations you could have. You have the conversation with people that do not want to include those who have any type of history with PED accusations or PED positive tests. If so, there are only three people that could be brought up. That's Daniel Cormier, George St. Pierre, and Demetrius Johnson. And I'm not including Conor McGregor in any of these talks because A, he never defended either of his belts, and B, you know, I feel like we still have a lot left to see with Conor McGregor. Um, so if you do want to have the conversation that includes the guys that have a hist tainted history of not being able to pass all of their drug tests, then the three aforementioned would be included, Demetrius Johnson, George St. Pierre, and, and, and um, Daniel Cormier. And then you have to add in John Jones and Anderson Silva into the mix. That's when the waters get a little bit murky and the sights get a little bit foggy and uh, the conversation begins a little bit, begins to become a little bit more interesting. However, look at Daniel Cormier's resume. You could sit there and tell me that he has two losses to John Jones if you are on that throw the PED thing out of it type of, if you're in that type of spectrum. If you're in the, what I like to call baseball world of the side of the spectrum, you would not include, D, you would not include John Jones or Anderson Silva and one of those two losses never happened. It's technically a no contest. So here's the bottom line. Daniel Cormier's resume includes Anderson Silva, Alexander Gustafson, Anthony Johnson twice, obviously Steve Amiocic, Dan Henderson, Josh Barnett, Frank Mir, Antonio Bigfoot Silva, Roy Nelson, Ryan Bader, Jeff Munson, Tony Johnson Jr., etc., etc. And now becomes the only man other than Conor McGregor to hold two belts simultaneously. And given the indications that he's given to media, including his interview yesterday with Ariel Hawani, he wants that last light heavyweight title defense before he gives it up. Got to respect him, man. Because you, if, you do, if you do something that only one person on this planet has done before, like Connor did, you're going to want to outdo them if you can, right? I mean, that's the mentality that I would have, at least. He said he has interest in defending against Shogun. That's, a, that's possibly the biggest, and smart, the biggest and smartest fight, maybe even the biggest fight you could make 
at light heavyweight because there's no reason for Cormier to take on Gustafson again, and there's no reason for Cormier to take on Yoel Romero moving up to 205 pounds. I think Cormier defending his light heavyweight title for the last time against Yoel Romero would be the stupidest fight he could possibly take. We've seen how Robert Whitaker came out of both of those Yoel Romero fights. He came out bloody and beaten and battered. He came out victorious, but he came out barely still intact. Torn ACLs and broken bones and facial disfigurations alike. You know, like I said, I have a lot to get to today. So I'm just going to kind of go bang, bang through every topic I have and you know, if you want to have a greatest of all time conversation and you're not including Daniel Cormier in it just because of the John Jones lost, please get out of my face and do not talk to me about mixed martial arts. So moving on, uh, the biggest disappointment of the week outside of maybe the Nganu Lewis abomination, and I'll get to that in a second, was the withdrawal of UFC featherweight champ Max Holloway. On UFC tonight, when he did his interview on Wednesday, he he looked terrible, he sounded terrible, he did not fit the part of someone who was ready to go in and engage in a possible um, 25-minute glorified gladiator spectacle. So what I read was on the day of the open workouts, which he also did not look himself in, Came back to his hotel room, took a nap. They tried to wake him up from his nap. They had trouble doing it. It was an issue. They took, it took way too long for him to come to his senses. He had flashing vision. He had slurred speech. I mean, yeah, you, you rush him to the ER. They, you, you rush him to the ER, and in the hospital room, a doctor's like, uh, this guy has a what coming up on Saturday? Uh, n- no, he doesn't. Nuh-uh. No, no, he does not. Not anymore. You know. So that being said, Brian Ortega obviously did not take a fight, which was the smart thing to do. They tried to make him versus Stevens, then they tried to make Stevens versus Edgar. Just couldn't make either of it in such short notice. And I'm glad there was no interim title on the line for that. Holding Max and Ortega possibly for the future is the right decision. However, We don't know how long Max is going to be out. And from certain indications from very reliable sources, Max Holloway could be out for a while. So where does that leave the UFC featherweight division? Which is very quickly becoming one of the most stacked and upcoming talent-rich prospect divisions in the entire world. In UFC and Bellator, both. Bellator's 145-pound class is stacked. 145 seems like it's becoming home for a lot of people. So let's just say that Max is out for a long, extended period of time, but does plan on coming back to defend his belt. All right. What options do you have if you're the UFC? Obviously, your number one option is Ortega. Undefeated, finished everybody he's fought inside the octagon, had this shot against Holloway locked up. He's obviously going to be half of that plan. Now, Jeremy Stevens, with the win over Jose Aldo at the end of the month in Calgary, surely becomes the other half of it. Or at least the next guy in line if Holloway comes back relatively soon. But what if Aldo beats Stevens? And I think there's a great chance Jose Aldo will do that. Just my opinion. It's a messed up situation you got at the top there. Because I'm not throwing Aldo back into a title fight at any time soon unless he wins his next two fights. He's already lost his last two title fights. So, that's not a good situation. All right. On to what became the replacement co-main event. Dear Lord, what the fuck was that? Francis Ngannou... Francis Ngannou and Derek Lewis were surely expected to engage 
in one of those hide your kids, hide your wife, don't blink type of fights. And what did we get? We got the second lowest statistical output in a UFC fight in the history of the promotion. I'm sure nobody expected that. The lowest output of a fight that went over 15 minutes was a Jens Pulver fight. I cannot be, I, I honestly cannot remember who it was, but it was in the early UFC days before UFC 30. Whose fault is this? Is it Ngannou's? I would say most of the blame is on Ngannou's shoulders. Is it Derek Lewis's? How much of this is Derek Lewis's fault? Well, Derek Lewis has had back problems in the past. We know this because he pulled out of his fight with Fabricio Verdum the day of the fight because of his back problems. So I'm not giving that much of the blame to Derek Lewis too. Plus, Derek Lewis had the injury and he threw more punches and obviously ended up winning the fight. That being said, how much is the UFC to blame with it? Well, I didn't think the UFC had any part to blame with it until Dana White said at the post-fight press conference something about Francis Ngannou's supposed ego that has reportedly become out of control. Um, that's kind of your fault a little bit. You were the one that did say in the UFC 220 pre-fight press conference you had to sneak into the introduction when talking about his fight with Stipe that he hit harder than a Mack truck. Stipe was irritated at you guys for promoting Nganu way more than you did him, and I get it. The possible future UFC first African champion had something to the ring to make him a rock star. But still, you have to promote your champion. You just have to. I mean, it doesn't make sense not to. Granted, Dana White is the best fight promoter on the planet, if you ask me. I've spent time and time again belittling guys like Bob Arum and Oscar De La Hoya who think otherwise. They're idiots, if you think. If you, I mean, yeah, pretty much. More so De La Hoya than, than Arum. But. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I sat and watched Nganu and Lewis, and I was just in shock. Looked like the crowd was having fun, though. They were doing the wave. They had flashlights going on. Like they were having fun. Um, other winners on the UFC 226 main card, uh, Anthony Pettis and Mike Perry both look better than they ever have. You know, if you would have told me Anthony Pettis was going to submit Michael Chiesa in the second round, someone did try to tell me that. Shout out Nick Dietrich. Uh, I would have called you insane. But he did it. Shout out to him. Mike Perry was the only prediction I got right on the main card. Check this out. Between the Tough 27 finale and UFC 226 combined, I went an abysmal 9 and 14. Sheesh. So Anthony Pettis submitting Michael Chiesa and uh, Mike Perry getting a close but agreed upon by me split decision over Paul Felder. And then Gokan Saki, you know, after kind of getting lucky in his first fight against Enrique in Japan with that huge right hook that dropped him at the end of the first round. He found out what MMA striking was all about. Khalil Roundtree, winner by KO, punches 136 into round one. You know, my one thing I will say about that is people who think that these kickboxers, and I'm going to get to Adesanya in a minute because he's obviously the exception. Disclaimer. People think that these guys that come over from kickboxing into MMA are just going to be world beaters that are on another level as far as their striking is concerned, and that's just not the case. The gloves are so much bigger in kickboxing. You can cover up with them. The movement is so different. The technicalities are completely different. The threat of the takedown obviously scares the shit out of some people. 
And as my friend Kobe from Kobe's Corner said on our roundtable podcast we had with John McElroy the other day, if you do not know about that, check that out on Spreaker or on my Twitter. I have reposted that multiple times. It's a great podcast to be a part of. The fear of the takedown has scared the shit out of Saki and Ngannou. How about this, though? Blue corner fighters went 5-0 and on the main card. Can't remember the last time that happened. Betting underdogs went 5-0 and on the main card. Yano. Quick notes from winners of the prelims. Um, Paulo Costa looks like a monster. Um, he should be out for some time because I think he injured his hand, but he looked tremendous against Uriah Hall. He's now 12-0, 4-0 record in the UFC. He was the biggest favorite on the card, and he looked like Hall was hurting him for a little bit, but Hall stood in the pocket and fought with him, and it gained praise from Dana White. So, Rafael Asuncao, I could, I could really have a whole podcast about the Bantamweight division's title picture and all the scenarios you could put into it. Basically, Cody and TJ's rematch hold, puts that on hold for a while because if Cody wins that again, you have to have a trilogy. But, but Rafael Asuncao, has all but earned his trilogy fight with TJ. He said that he's not going to fight again unless it's for the belt. Well, to be honest with you, I don't think his next fight's going to be for the belt. If you ask me, a Sun Sao has to fight Marias again. And the winner of that is next in line for the belt. Make that fight for later this year. Winner, winner absolutely gets the next shot. Dominic Cruz is sitting there in front of those guys, but you know, he's been out for a while. Make him fight. Make him fight probably twice. What's the fair? That's the what's the right thing to do? Sun Tzu is eleven and one at bantamweight in the UFC, with his only loss being to Dillashaw, and he has beaten Dillashaw. So. Other winners: Drakkar Close wins by unanimous decision over Lando Venata. Curtis Millinder, he looks tremendous. He wins a unanimous decision over Max Griffin. Dan Hooker, someone get this guy a winner of someone get this guy a ranked opponent. He is he has looked unstoppable since moving down to lightweight. 4-0 with four stoppages. He gets a first round knockout of Gilbert Burns at 2 minutes and 28 seconds. And Emily Whitmire, a cast member on the 26th season of The Ultimate Fighter, gets it done by unanimous decision over Jamie Moyle to improve to 1-1 one one in the UFC in her strawweight debut. Pretty solid card. Um I had fun watching it, so uh, I'll quickly bang through the tough, the tough 27 finale. Israel Adesanya is for real. I think any questions we might have had about him have been answered. He stuffed 11 of Brad Tavares' 12 takedowns. He looked incredible within his movement. He confused Tavares. He made it tough for Tavares to touch him. And anybody like that that is going to be almost impossible to touch can win against almost anyone in that division. Now then you add into the fact that make it impossible for someone to touch him on the feet and damn near impossible for someone to take him down, oof, you have a really tough out in that middleweight division. So he's for real. He's going to be in that top seven, top eight when the middleweight rankings, new middleweight rankings come out tomorrow. Uh, the finale card mostly sucked, if I'm going to be honest with you. Um, especially the lightweight final between Mike Trezano and Joe Gennetti. I mean, that second round was embarrassing. And I thought... I thought the whole time, I had no idea why Mark Goddard was not standing those guys up. I mean, Mike Trezano was bull punching Giannetti on his ass. And Giannetti's laying there on the ground like this. Granted, though, I don't think Joe Giannetti, Joe Giannetti shows up for the biggest fight of his life in a fight that he was favored to win and probably should have won and was probably talented enough to win. And he looked like he would have rather been anywhere else on the planet. Doesn't make sense to me. I don't know if it's the octagon jitters, but I mean, you have to realize the guy you're fighting has the same jitters as you. You're both making your debut. I don't know. I hope he gets another fight in the UFC because I don't think that's the Joe Giannetti that we'll see going forward, but it's um, going to be questionable. There's no way Dana White was pleased with, with that. I don't even think Trezano looked especially well. You ask me, and this is no bias whatsoever, we had him on the podcast about a, a couple of weeks ago. Luis Pena was by far the best fighter on that, on that show. By far. He looks the cleanest on the feet. 
He is obviously equally as dangerous with submissions as shown of his $50,000 winning bonus submission of a submission artist in his own right, Richie Smolin, winner by first round mounted guillotine. I don't know how you could argue that he is by he was by far the best fighter on that show and would have won. Please, 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 the UFC, please match him up against Trezano. Let him prove that he would have won that show. Um, speaking of winners of the show, Brad Katona gets it done in the featherweight final by defeating upstart second chance gainer Jay Cuccinello, Jay Cuccinello, I should say. 30-26, 30 30-26, 30-26. Um, Brad Katona is going to drop to 135 and just add another shark into that infested water of that exactly at bantamweight of top prospects. Man, like I keep saying it over and over again, 135 pounds is going to be a bitch to fight in in the future. They are stacked as far as up-and-coming talent is concerned. Stacked. And Katona's just another chip in that in in that dealer's hand. He looked great with the boxing with his boxing. He really, you know, he dropped Cuccinello a couple times. Solid on top. Can finish on the ground like he did when he showed us he could against uh, Bryce Mitchell, who took out uh, DC's number one guy, uh, Tyler Diamond. Hope they give Tyler Diamond another one fight. He's clearly talented. He just has a couple of things to figure out. You know, Alex Caceres, Martin Bravo, fight of the night. That was great. Roxanne Modafferi defeats Barb Honchak by TKO in round two to get her first UFC win she's been searching for so long for. Montana De La Rosa becomes the second woman in the women's flyweight division to improve. Actually, third, my fault, to improve to 2-0 in the women's flyweight division after Jillian Robertson and Jessica I by submitting Rachel Ostovich four minutes and 21 seconds into round three. Um, John Gunther gets his, gets his hand raised by majority decision over Costa Rica's Alan Zuniga. 29-28, 29-28, 28 As before mentioned, Bryce Mitchell with the win over Tyler Diamond. Steven Peterson gets his hand raised by split decision over Matt Bissett. I thought Bissett won that fight. It was a close fight, though. Could have gone either way. And then, I saved this for last, both Alessio DiCirico and Gerald Mearshart pick up huge wins as underdogs against top blue-chip middleweight prospects in respectively Julian Marquez and Oscar Pijota. DiCirico gets the win by split decision. Mearshart gets the win by rear naked choke. Five seconds left on the clock in round two. Um, I say both of them should fight each other. You know, be a great fight. Two guys that press the action. DiCirico took some shots, man. He took some shots. So why not book those guys against each other? It'd be a great fight. All right. Moving on, current events quickly, and I will get into my picks for all of the fights in UFC, Bellator, and boxing coming up for this weekend. Um, one, a couple things. There's really only two things I want to touch on. Number one, um, really, really, really starting to get more and more curious as every single day passes on who the hell is going to be booked for the UFC 228 main event. We are now less than two months out, and we have no clue. You know, we were at 223, and we already knew the 227 main event, and 226, and 225. We are not aware of 228 yet. You know, obviously, by the time that 227 rolls around, they're going to need one. You should probably get one sooner than that. There aren't a lot of options either. It's crazy. Really intrigued to see who it ends up becoming. So far, your UFC 228 card looks pretty nice, and I will read these off, these fights off as fights that are official and fights that are rumored. There are only two fights, official, done deal, announced, ready to go for UFC 228 in Dallas, Texas. Those fights are... At featherweight, an absolute cracker between Zabit Magomed Sharapov and Yair Rodriguez. At bantamweight, a top seven clash between Jimmy Rivera and John Dodson. Now the three fights that are pretty much all but done. 
Bantamweight, Aljamain Sterling and Cody Stamen in a grudge match I've been trying to see for a while. You have a women's strawweight title eliminator. Winner easily will be the one to take on Rose Namajunas, Jessica Andrade, and Karolina Kovalkiewicz. Also, I mean, it seemed to me that the women's flyweight title will be defended for the first time between Nico Montano and Valentina Shevchenko. You cannot make that your main event, though. Unless you want to do 80,000 pay-per-view buys, you cannot make that your main event. So, yeah, they got to figure that out ASAP. And uh, my feeling is they probably are. Right now, maybe, as we speak. Before I get into my picks, let me just say, um, Bellator's picking up steam, man. With the signing of Machida and uh, the knocking on the door, potentially, of Josh Barnett. And, you know, you have... All of these events coming up today. It, it today it was announced Bellator 207 on October 12th, the Mohegan Sun Arena in Uncasville, Connecticut, will feature the first of two Bellator heavyweight Grand Prix semifinals. It will be Ryan Bader. It will be Matt Mitrione. It should be fantastic, and it's presumed that the night after on October 13th will be the blockbuster event. It, what might be, depending on how you look at it whether it's that or Gegard versus Rory, might be the biggest fight in Bellator history, Fedor Emelianenko and Shale Sonnen. And then you have Gegard versus Rory with Rampage versus Vanderlei 4 as your co-main for Bellator 206. 206, 207, 208, all within two weeks and all should be huge events. That's going to be a massive 14-day span for that promotion. So... Now um, let's move on to my picks. I'm going to go UFC Boise, Bellator 202 and 203 main cards, and then I'm going to just reel off quickly. There are five world title fights in boxing this weekend. Um, you know, let's do it. So here's how I do it. Uh, with the UFC, I'm going to go main card from first fight on the main card to the main event in that order in order of how the fights would go. Then from prelims on, I'll go, I'll go rapid fire, just picking the prelims from, from the featured prelim on to the very first fight of the night in that order. So in the main card, all odds that I am going to be spitting out to you are courtesy of betonline.ag. Uh, and they're also, these odds obviously can change within the next few days. I would expect some of these odds to change as I'm looking at them. And these odds are applicable as far as Ju Tuesday, July 10th at 7.07 p.m. So, starting in the women's bantamweight division, a huge fight for both ladies here between 6th ranked Kat Zingano and 7th ranked Marion Renault. Marion Renault, the very slight favorite right now in what's basically a pick -em at minus 115, Kat Zingano at minus 105. Renault coming off a submission victory over Sarah McMahon back in Orlando in February and Kat Zingano coming off her third consecutive loss to now number 2 ranked women's bantamweight and surefire future women's bantamweight title challenger Catlin Vieira by split decision, even though it should have been a unanimous decision, it was a split decision. Um, Marion Renault has looked incredible in her last couple of fights. Her grappling looks steady. Her top game looks incredible. She submitted a former Olympic silver medalist in Sarah McMahon. Um, you know, it's going to be tough for me to think that Kat Zingano can win this fight it's not going to be tough for me to think that she can because she absolutely can, but it's going to be tough for me to think that Kat Zingano is likely to win this fight given her last fight and the matchup and, and the stylistical matchup that Marion Renault kind of presents to her. I think Renault is on fire, and I think Zingano is losing her touch. I'm going to go ahead and go with Marion Renault to get this fight done by decision. Then you have the return of former interim featherweight and undisputed featherweight title challenger Chad Mendez. He's the minus 220 favorite coming off a two-year suspension from, from USADA, taking on in another Team Alpha Male versus Alliance MMA Classic, taking on number 12, Miles Jury, who is 8-2 very quietly in the UFC, the 12th-ranked featherweight in the world. Um, 
I'm not a huge fan of Chad Mendez in this fight. Miles Jury has fought more. Re he's fought recently. He has come off of injury multiple times and looked great. Uh, we're not sure how Chad Mendez is going to be able to shake off the rust. I would say Miles Jury at a plus 185 clip is a very fantastic value bet to make, and that's one I would do. I'm going to take Miles Jury to win this fight by decision, as Chad Mendez probably could have used a little bit of an easier fight coming back in. But, you know, I could be wrong, and Chad Mendes could still look to be world-class. We shall find out. Moving up to the main card as a result of Paul Felder and James Vick's original co-main event slot being canceled. We have welterweights and top future welterweights, Randy Brown and Nico Price. Another minus 115 paired to minus 105 um, odds maker special. Damn near pick em has surprisingly enough for me Randy Brown as the minus 115 beneficiary favorite and Nico Price as the very very slim underdog if I'm being honest with you I would expect that to change by the end of the week Nico Price has looked like a killer he has just been he has just been absolutely dominant uh his only loss has come against Vincente Luque who has also looked dominant um you know, I've got to go with Nico Price here. Randy Brown looked tremendous in his dispa dispatching of uh, Mickey Gall. Don't know why I drew a blank there. Back at UFC 217 last November. And Nico Price has finished, I believe, all but one of his opponents without looking since all of his, all but one of his wins in the UFC. He's got great wins under his resume too. It's guys like Alex Morono and Alan Joban. Uh, took out a tough veteran and George Sullivan back in February. I'm gonna go with Nico Price to get it done here by round two submission. So now moving on, we have Dennis Bermudez taking on Rick Glenn. The featherweight's really coming out here. Dennis Bermudez, as of right now, is a minus two fifty favorite. And Rick Glenn, the minus 210 underdog on the comeback. I think this is a great fight for Dennis Bermudez. Rick Glenn looked a little iffy in his last fight against the aforementioned Miles Fury Jury. Um, if I had one pick to make as my lock on this main card, it would be Dennis Bermudez. I think he'll get it done and use his wrestling to win by decision. In the co-main event... We have Super Sage Northcutt. Moving back down to welterweight for whatever reason. I, I mean, he says it's a weight cut, and I can totally understand it, but, you know, I'll spit out the numbers in a second. He takes on welterweight mainstay Zach Otto, who is coming off a win over Mike Pyle by knockout in Pyle's retirement fight at UFC 222. Two weeks prior, Sage Northcutt squeaked out a controversial decision win uh, over, I believe his name is T-Ball Guti. Um, I'm making sure of that. Yes, that is correct. T-Ball Guti. Sage Northcutt gets that win by decision. I don't think that he gets that win if they're not in his home state of Texas. Uh, Sage Northcutt right now, the slight minus 130 favorite. Um, the guy's 10-0 and at lightweight, and he's 0-2 at welterweight. So, you know, what does that tell you? But he's huge, man. I, I saw a picture of him today, and he weighed in at 181 at these new UFC uh, weight check-ins that they're doing, which I think are awesome. Uh, and I'm, like, looking at it like he's got so much muscle on him. I don't know how he can shed that 11 pounds by Friday morning. Not a lot of weight to cut, though, especially if you're a UFC fighter. And now he's moving back up to welterweight. And I just still don't think that that weight class is home for him. I'm going to go with Zach Otto by upset decision. Uh, that would be, as it stands right now, and this could possibly change, four out of five of my upsets. Uh, four out of five picks I've shed, bleh, given off so far are technically upsets. However, I'd expect the Nico Price line to move. I'd expect, um, take that back, that's three, possibly four, because I would expect possibly people to be high on Zingano against Marion Renault. And the main event, Junior Dos Santos, the seventh-ranked heavyweight in the world, according to the UFC rankings, will be returning from a USADA suspension that 
before people reserve their judgments, he has been exonerated of having any to do, anything to do with against one of the high, most highly touted newcomers the UFC has seen in the heavyweight division in a very long time, the former World Series of Fighting heavyweight champion, Bulgaria's own Blagoy Ivanov. So people were scratching their heads as to why a UFC newcomer would be in the blue corner for his UFC debut. And if you are asking yourself that question, I would just advise you to go watch some of his fights in the World Series of Fighting. A very respectable organization. Blagoy, Blagoy Ivanov has also competed in Bellator and also was a fight away from fighting for the Bellator Heavyweight Championship when he was submitted by... None other than the current number three ranked heavyweight in the UFC's rankings, Alexander Volkov. Other than that, he is undefeated. He defended his World Series of Fighting heavyweight title three times. He can knock you out and he can submit you on the ground. I think this is a fight that is flying under the radar here. But I do think the bright lights of the octagon will get to even off. I think JDS, if Volkov is the toughest test he's faced to date, I think JDS is very close right behind him, and I think it might be too much for him. Blagoy Ivanov gets KO'd for the first time in his career in round two, and Junior Dos Santos announces his return to the UFC heavyweight contendership ladder. So just going to go bang, bang for the rest of the prelims. Uh, a couple of ranked bantamweights in the, in the featured prelim. Uh, I like Alan, Alejandro Perez to take out former WEC bantamweight champion Eddie Wineland by first round TKO. Um, really tough fight for 10th ranked featherweight Darren Elkins. I'm not counting him out. Like, I won't count him out ever again. After what I saw with him against A, Mirsad Bektik, which is a much larger case than also B, Michael Johnson. But Alexander Folkanovsky is just going to be a tough fight for him. 15 1 overall, 4 0 in the UFC and is ready to announce his name in the forelore of future featherweight studs. I like Alexander Volkanovsky by decision. I don't think he's going to finish Elkins, but I do like him to get his hand raised. I'll also, a quick note about that fight. Darren Elkins is the biggest underdog on the card. Plus 280, Volkanovsky on the comeback, minus 340. Um, no relation to Khabib Nurmagomedov. We have flyweights, Saeed Nurmagomedov, from Dagestan, making his debut in the UFC against Justin Scoggins. Uh, Scoggins has lost his last two. This could be a back-against-the-wall must-win fight for him against the UFC newcomer, Saeed Nurmagomedov, and I do not think his fortune will turn. I like Nurmagomedov by decision. Uh, in a fight that I believe that could be fight of the night, we have former Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series contract winner Kurt Hollibaugh taking on former RFA featherweight champion Ryoni Barcelos as they both will write the newest chapters in their UFC careers. Hollibaugh has a previous fight in the UFC where he is 0-1. And these guys combined for 20 of their 28 wins finishing by or coming by way of finish. This Easily could be fight of the night. Both of these guys swing for the fences every single time they step into the cage. Um, Barcelos, one of those Brazilians that comes from a jiu-jitsu background that is so well-versed on his feet. Uh, I mean, this is really a coin toss. Odd, odds makers give it to Hollabaugh at minus 190 with Barcelos at the plus 155 comeback. I expect both of these guys to absolutely give it their all and throw leather from bell to bell. And I do not see either one of them going down. I like Hollabaugh to win it by close decision, probably a split decision. This fight should be incredible. And for those of you who have not seen any film on either of them, watch it because you will understand. And in the three-pack of Fight Pass prelims, number six-ranked women's flyweight Liz Carmouche coming off a controversial split decision loss to Alexis Davis. Gets a really tough draw in one of the top women's flyweights, one of the top consensus women's flyweights in the world, in Invicta flyweight champion Jennifer Maya. Now former Invicta flyweight champion Jennifer Maya. Jennifer Maya probably should have made her UFC debut a long time ago. Um, she has wins over a ton of UFC veterans. <sighs> tough fight for Carmouche. You know, Liz Carmouche being a part of the very first female fight in UFC history, and now she's welcoming in maybe the future of this UFC flyweight division. A win for Jennifer Meyer puts her right there in the thick of title contention uh, with some of her former Invicta flyweight counterparts like Roxanne Modafferi, like Andrea Lee. 
I do think Jennifer Meyer will win this fight by decision. She's the plus 100 underdog as it stands, and Carmouche the minus 120 favorite. Uh, in the bantamweight division, Mark, Mark De La Rosa, actually this is in the flyweight division, uh, I apologize. Mark De La Rosa made his debut in the UFC at bantamweight against Tim Elliott, who is a usual flyweight. However, this fight will be at flyweight. They will take on the Rufus Sport Milwaukee, or they will take on the Rufus Sport product Elias Garcia, who was a beneficiary of a UFC contract in the first episode of the newest season of Dana White looking for a fight. So, I got to go with Garcia to win by round three submission here. I have seen a little bit of tape on Garcia, and he sh- he looks like a top prospect. Um, okay, so now what I'm seeing is this fight is at bantamweight, uh, which would kind of surprise, uh, I don't know. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Every, every fight that Garcia has contested in so far in his career has been at flyweight. It says right here, though, on Tapology that it's going to be at 135 pounds. Um, I guess I will go with that. So, Garcia's never competed at 135 pounds, if that is truly the case. I do like Garcia to win that fight by round three submission. He's the minus 135 favorite. And then um, in the latest chapter of the New York State Athletic Commission's stupid and horrendous decisions, the Jessica Aguilar-Jody Escabel fight that was canceled due to Aguilar's quote-unquote chapped lips from a couple of months ago was rescheduled for this card. Jessica Aguilar definitely with her back against the wall as a future potential world beater in the women's strawweight division. She now finds herself still looking for that first UFC win going into her third contest with Jody Escabel, who is 0-1, coming off of a co-main event slot loss to Karolina Kovalkiewicz in Poland. Pretty tough debut, if you ask me. I like Jessica Aguilar to get this fight by decision. There's whole, not a whole lot to harp on here. Both of these women will probably stand up for a majority of the contest until Aguilar will attempt to get it to the ground. I think Aguilar still has a little bit of fight or potential to be seen left in her, and I like her to get it done. Viva la Mexico for her and Alejandro Perez, who I both think will get the nods. In Bellator this weekend, we have a couple of title fights, uh, a double dip on Friday and Saturday. On Friday night, they are live from the Windstar Resort and Casino. Bellator 202, headlined by the women's featherweight title between Julia Budd and Talita Noguera. I'm just going to go bang, bang with these. I like Talita Noguera to become the new women's featherweight champion in Bellator by first round submission, knocking off Julia Budd in what would be a huge upset. Um, In the co-main event, you have former bantamweight champion Eduardo Dantas taking on former UFC interim bantamweight title challenger Michael McDonald. I like Michael McDonald by decision. At middleweight, Chris Honeycutt and Leo Liete. I like Honeycutt by decision. And then at heavyweight, Valentin Moldovsky will be taking on Ernest James. I like Valentin Moldovsky by decision. At Bellator 203, I'm only going to do the first three fights because those are the only three fights that have any names that are worth mentioning. Everyone else is kind of just guys that they've picked from the regional scene over in Italy. Bellator 203, by the way, will be live from Rome, Italy, in what should be one of the most exciting and high-level fights on the Bellator calendar this year is the featherweight championship of the world between Patricio Pitbull Frieri and Daniel Veitchel in a rematch. In their first fight, Daniel Veitchel dropped Frieri in the first round before Frieri came off of the stool and knocked him out in round two. Uh, Veitchel's only loss in Bellator at an 8-1 clip came in that fight against Frieri. I think he's going to do it again and then set himself up for a potential huge showdown coming down the line this year with Emmanuel Sanchez, who, if you ask me, is is first in line to challenge for that featherweight strap next. In the co-main event, Italian-born Alessio Saccara, who is coming off his failed bid at a world title against Rafael Carvalho, takes on the debuting Jamie Sloan. I like Alessio Saccara by round one KO. And then you have... Andre Koreshkov, former welterweight champion and probable Bellator welterweight Grand Prix participant, taking on the Montenegrin Vaso Bakasevic. Um, this seems to me like a huge mismatch, and I like Koreshkov to win by round two, TKO. And before I wrap it up, I have five predictions to make in boxing. In, on Saturday, there are five world title fights. Um, starting with the WBA super middleweight 
title, the regular super middleweight title held by Tyrone Tyron Zoiga. He will be defending in Offenburg, Germany against British Rocky Fielding. As of right now, Zoiga is the minus 360 favorite. Fielding, the plus 270 favorite. Pretty decently close odds, excuse me, for boxing. I like Zoiga to win by decision, potentially setting him up to take on the winner of this year's later on super middleweight world super series title fight between George Groves and Callum Smith. Uh, I got to go with Zoiga here. I think he gets it done by decision. And then on ESPN top rank at 7 p.m., the card kicks off with, strangely enough, in my opinion, the number one, and according to many people, either him or Josh Taylor is the number one junior welterweight in the world now that Terrence Crawford has moved up and claimed a belt at actual welterweight. So the 140-pound WBA interim title will be on the line as Regis Proger- Regis Progress will take on Juan Jose Velasco. Again, he, I mean, this is a huge mismatch. Velasco might be undefeated, 19-0 with 11 KOs, but Progress is just on another level. He's coming off absolutely dismantling former world title challenger Julio Sandango. I like Progress to win by round five TKO. I don't see any possible way Velasco can win this fight. It has the maximum betting odds of Regis Progress, a minus one or a minus ten thousand, a one hundred to one favorite. Velasco, a sixteen to one fa- uh, underdog. And then on ESPN, at, at ESPN Plus, I should say at nine p.m. Former. World superstar, I mean, still world superstar at a much lower degree now. Manny Pacquiao will return, and he will take on Lucas Matisse for the WBA regular welterweight championship held by Matisse. This is going down in Lumpur, in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, Manny Pacquiao currently the minus 225 favorite. Uh, Matisse at plus 175. Matisse has knocked out 36 of his 39 opponents. If there's one bet, I promise you, if you are listening to this, you need to take this weekend across any fight. It is that one of these two men will not survive until the final bell. Someone in this fight is going to be knocked out. And I think that someone is going to be Matisse. I think Pacquiao will claim gold, will claim WBA gold and be a world champion once again. Maybe right off into the sunset. Who knows? On the undercard, there are two world title fights as well. The regular WBA 126-pound title is vacant and up for grabs. Jack Tapora takes on Edivaldo Ortega. I like Jack Tapora by round 8 TKO. And then the IBF flyweight title is up for grabs. Uh, The winner of this fight is um, slated to take on WBA champion. I believe, no, WBA champion is Artem Delakian. I think WBO champion. It's hard to keep all of it in intact with all of the different belts. Uh, I think WBO champion, um, the, the winner of this fight should be taking on the WBO champion, Heroin on Sahas. It is f- in what would be a unification bout. It is Moruti Matalane against Mohamed Wasim. I like Matalane to win that fight by decision. Those three fights are all for world titles and they are all available to you on ESPN Plus on Saturday night at 9 p.m. So it should be a good Saturday. Um, Only thing that I have talked about so far is Bellator 202. That'll be on Friday night. Everything else I've mentioned will be in a loaded slate for combat sports fans on Saturday. Uh, Tune in with me next time on, on this upcoming Saturday as my friend Connor Maloney will join the show, and we will go over a special edition of the MLB All-Star Break edition it should be fun we'll give you our all-stars who we voted for who we believe are the midway point not exactly midway point but all-star break award winners and our predictions going down the stretch i'm a red sox fan he's a yankees fan should be fun and i hope you join me thanks a lot for joining me today on the 16th edition and 7th mma edition of the bottom line and until next time we will see you then